Good morning once again. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> okay, it's good. You know, good morning and welcome to the first Sunday of December. You know, I have been looking forward to this worship service because it's literally a countdown now to Christmas. Now, before we begin this time of our worship to God, let us come to Him in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus. We thank you so much that he is the captain of our salvation, that he is the prophecy, that he is God with us. We thank you so much that we can come to your presence to offer you worship for the God that you are to offer you praise because you have dealt with us, because you have blessed us so richly. Our Heavenly Father, we pray this morning that you may be in our midst to hear the worship that we give you. May you open up our hearts to receive your words. For we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know what I look forward to in celebrating Christmas is that I look forward to celebrating this joyous event, not just as uh, my immediate family, but with, with you guys, with Bethel Church. You know, this morning, let us begin this season of anticipation of celebrating Christmas. Our first Christmas carol is entitled, O come, all ye faithful. In our red hymnal also, uh, hymn 145. And this carol, you know, it's actually an invitation to come and offer worship and praise to the Lord Jesus. And in the Bible, you know, we can read of this account where we can read when the angels of God appeared to the shepherds as they guard their flocks of sheep in the fields by night. And the angel invited these shepherds to come and see the Lord Jesus, who was born, born and put in a manger, wrapped in solid cloth. You know, this morning, may, may we have that heart of worship also. You know, as the shepherds left, um, left the stable, they left praising God. May we have that heart of worship and praise too. Let us sing of our first carol, O come, all ye faithful. Thank you for singing our, our first hymn. Now, Christmas, and it is a festive time to celebrate with friends and family the birth of the Lord Jesus. More than just the celebration itself. Christmas, it should be a time to also reflect upon the Lord Jesus and how he came down from heaven to dwell among us. You know, Matthew includes this special prophecy of the Lord Jesus. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 23, it says this, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated, God with us. Today we must appreciate this prophecy that has been fulfilled, that the Lord Jesus Christ, he is Emmanuel, he is God with us. Our next song is not in the red hymnal, it's in the big, thick, dark blue songbook uh, called Voices in Praise. Song, uh, Voices in Praise. And the page of this song is uh, 758, entitled Down from His Glory. You know, this song sings of the Lord Jesus 
coming down to us. It describes him as fully man, and yet he is fully God. This year, I've, I have a newfound appreciation for the Christmas story. Not because there were angels or you know, supernatural things happened, but because the Lord Jesus was simply born, not to a rich family, but to a poor family. Not in a hospital, but just in a stable where animals live. He wasn't placed in an incubator. He was just placed on vegetarian animals' eating trough. What I appreciate of the Christmas story is it's just a miracle that the Son of God, He came down to us. <clears throat> it's sobering to know that the Lord Jesus, he, he didn't live very long physically on earth. I'm 33 years old this year, and very soon I'm going to turn 34. You know, the Lord Jesus lived around my age, but through the life he lived, the ministry he entrusted to his disciples, the glory of God, it was revealed to him that through his birth, God gave us the Savior of the world. Well, just before I lead into the hymn, I'm just going to get my big, thick, blue songbook. Well, thank you for your patience, and um, let us take up this song together. You know, as, as a lot of us know, on Friday and Saturday, it was Black Friday, because it is just sales everywhere. And, you know, my wife and I, we did what was um, best. We avoided the shops as best as possible. <laughs> you know, there's so much hype about Christmas. Not that Christmas is bad, but the, the materialism of it, that it's only this year you can buy a plaque that says joy or peace or love or the nativity set. It's only this year you can buy a plastic stocking with chocolates in there. You know what stood out to me um, last, in last week's message was that the word rediscovery of God. It hit me. Because out in the world, it's like as if God does not exist. And last week's message spoke to me of rediscovering God and what He has done. Now what He, what he has done is He has given His only Son as a covenant to us that those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God he will give them the right to be called children of God to those who believe in his name. As we consider the glory of God, may we also consider the rediscovery of the Lord Jesus and the account of his birth. As we celebrate Christmas very shortly in a few weeks' time, May we consider the Lord Jesus, that it is because of him we can celebrate Christmas more meaningfully. I'd rather have Jesus, him 517. And may we not miss the special significance of rediscovering God, rediscovering the Lord Jesus afresh and his glory that the glory of God 
may be revealed to us through his word. And this morning, let us stand as we take up um, this hymn, I'd Rather Have Jesus. Please be seated. I'll pass the time to Reverend John. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, nice to see you all and also to see some different faces since last I was here. I won't say new faces because you're not that. You're quite old. <laughs> um, but it's nice to see you. And um, yeah, and have a chat with some of you already. Um, I haven't been here for, well, over 18 months, which is quite unusual for me, of course. Um, and there's a good reason, and I'm going to share that reason with you today. We talk at Christmas time of the Word becoming flesh. In other words, what it says, the Word became flesh. Well, I've had lots of words to say here for 20 years, and um, today they're going to become flesh. I want to tell you my story. I think it's appropriate at Christmas time. So I've called it, hmm, well, I think I have, ah, my Australian story. And I'm going to share that with you and uh, with my wife as well, but um, so that with me, you thank God at the wonders that he does and the goodness of God and the love of God. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, we come humbly but with gratitude in our hearts to you for your goodness to us each day and through life. Help us, Lord, to share what you have done for us, that your name be honoured and our hearts be touched. Open our hearts to hear from you this morning, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. I'm going to read from the Bible shortly. But not just now. I want to start off with, um, well, I've got a, and then for some reason this isn't working. Okay, good. My early years, well, there's a ship, the good ship Rockingham. On the good ship Rockingham came William and Eleanor Edwards and four children all the way from England, and they landed at Rockingham. That's why it's called Rockingham. <laughs> the ship was wrecked there, and they all got off safely. And um, that was in 1830. The colony was one year old in Perth, one year old, and um, my forebears arrived. So I have a long history. My great-great-grandfather, Finally settled in Beverly, and uh, yeah, that's their grave in Beverly, William and Eleanor Edwards, farmed at Beverly, and uh, built this little church where they were. They were good Anglicans, and built that church. And uh, well, we had a reunion there. Oh, I shouldn't go back. Uh, after, uh, in 1979, and I was the only preacher, so about 300 people didn't all fit in that little church. It seats about 30, but 300 sat on the fields, and we had a worship service and Thanksgiving. And the bottom one is me. At 25, I had become a Christian when I was 16 or 17 through the... Uh, or work or through the young people's department at uh, South Como Baptist Church. 
There's a history there, but I can't tell you everything. But um, my folks weren't churchgoers, probably not even Christian. Um, but I went to Sunday school and I felt warmed. I loved Sunday school. But no one encouraged me and I only lasted about six weeks. Um, but I did get a birthday card and I remember putting it away. And sometime later, I guess I was about 12, I was uh, cleaning my drawers and uh, I saw this card. Oh, what's that? And my mother was nearby somewhere and I said, Mum, what does wise mean? Busy mother, she said, you know what wise means. What are you asking me for? Well, it says here, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Oh. Oh. Well, in that case, it means definitely not cast out. So I read it again. Him that cometh to me, I will definitely not cast out. Oh, I like that. And I was warmed all over. That's all I can say. And so when I was invited to go to a youth group, I remembered that. And I went, willingly. And after some struggle, I became a Christian. But then my father passed away when I was 19. I had already planned that I'd be a missionary, but when he passed away, I uh, thought, well, that's the end of that. But uh, the reason why it was the end of that was because my mother was never well. And I realised that I would have to look after her. I had brothers and sisters, but I was the second eldest, and the eldest one wasn't even at home anymore. So I thought, well, I can't be a missionary. But then, in the next few years, she suddenly got better. And the way opened. And there I am at 25. I just finished Bible college and was on a farm at Wongan Hills, ready to go out as a missionary. And so we go from early years ooh, oh, okay, sorry, to missionary years. But there was my family, uh, youngest to oldest. And I am the, the oldest there. You can see me, you can tell me, can't you? Yeah, no. Uh, and only two of us are left now, my sister and I, and we'll be seeing her at Christmas time. But we went back to Beverly for that, uh, for that service. Well, then began um, what I call my missionary years. Um, and the missionary years started quite well, but quite early in my missionary years, my wife, um, after some romance, we were married at the St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Kuala Lumpur because I was a missionary in Malaysia and learning Hokkien. Li hobo. Okay, that means are you well? Li uh, chapava, it means have you eaten? Okay. Um, but... Um, uh, so began my missionary years, and uh, the, there's the wedding cake. There's a whole story there, but it'll take me till midday um, to tell you what happened with that cake. It, uh, but my wife made it herself anyway. Uh, but there's quite a lot of drama involved. <laughs> Not that she was a bad cook, but uh, one thing, the icing wouldn't dry in, in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, um, and while we were sitting there at the reception and the, I could watch this cake slowly descending <laughs> because the icing wasn't quite dry. But anyway, uh, there's more to it than that, but that'll do for now. And then uh, I took my wife back to where I had already been for two and a half years, Bula Kasap, Bamboo Village, uh, where uh, I was starting to learn, uh, starting to preach. I lived in that upstairs little room there, had one little room, which was very good for learning Hokkien. I named everything. There was the curtains, there was the bed. I had little town names on it all so that I could learn. And in God's goodness, I learned well. 
and was soon preaching there, and the church grew. I haven't got time for all that. And then after five years, um, five and a half there, establishing that church, we went back to another place called Tenjong Karang, which means Cape Coral, and you can see it's quite substantial. Uh, and this time it was the Chinese Methodist Church. We were there for <coughs> three and a half years. Um, and yes, by that time we had three children. And I'll tell you a bit more about them later, but you see the little boy in my arms? In uh, a tragic way he died. He had malaria, which wasn't supposed to be in Malaysia, but it was. And uh, he had a chloroquine injection, but was given an adult dose instead of an infant one. And he died in my wife's arms in about three minutes. And we were both there, fortunately. But that was a, a terrible thing. And uh, we both went into grief of all kinds. Um, but uh, there is his grave in Kuala Lumpur, our dearly loved son. But in God's goodness, we came home, had two years at home, and adopted a lad. Um, my wife couldn't have any more children due for health reasons and so on. So we adopted Martin. Um, okay, I will stop and pause a moment. We wondered why we were able to adopt him. It was so easy. We were told we wouldn't be able to, and then suddenly, yeah, we got a phone call. Would you like a baby, six weeks old? Oh, yes, okay. And then we discovered that he was a feeding problem. And he just could not take milk, uh, not cow's milk. Um, and uh, my wife never got a night's sleep for two years because he had to be fed about every two hours. Or, and uh, our other girls, our other children, took the solids um, Oh, well, within about three months anyway, not him, uh, no. two years. And he's still terrible to feed, and he's 50. Uh, <laughs> he drives his wife mad. Uh, meat and potatoes and rice, that's it. And no green, nothing good for you. Um, because he has this sensitive stomach, but he always had that. Probably fetal alcohol syndrome. But... He's overcome all that. And uh, he's now a uh, secondary school teacher at the Mandurah Baptist College and living near us with his wife and son. Okay. Then we went to Bunting, Chinese Methodist Church, and oh, it had a, a nice manse and it had a, well, in due course, a badminton court, wonderful things. Um, and they had a school bus and we started a Sunday school because I was the first missionary or my, and that's the Sunday school, and they're all singing Chike Nenge Sai Kinya Siye Koe Lake Kinya. You know what I'm saying, don't you? Ige Lianga Sanga Haida. One, two, three, four, five little children, you know. Five, ten little children go to heaven and so on. Okay. Um, after that, uh, we weren't allowed to stay in Malaysia anymore. Uh, government restrictions, we had to leave. We've been 16 years there off and on. So our mission sent us to Kaohsiung in Taiwan because the Hokkien we learned was also Taiwanese. So we went there and worked with the Presbyterian Church. There it is, the um, Virtuous Life Presbyterian Church in Kaohsiung. And that's me on the scooter. And, um, okay, where are we? Down here somewhere. Um, but then after a while, we got a call uh, to go to Taichung, which is in the middle of the island. I think I've got a map there. Kaohsiung is down there in the south, and we were moved to go to Taichung. Chung means middle, middle of Taiwan, Taichung. So there we were for the next three years, uh, establishing a church. By this time, and then began my pastoring years. Missionary years, you got them? Early years, missionary years. Now pastoring years, and by this time, there we are leaving Taiwan, 
Uh, there's my eldest daughter, Meryl, second daughter, Julie, and our now grown-up son, Martin. And we began a ministry at North Beach Baptist Church. We were there for eight and a half years. Okay, we'll go on. Then went to Atterdale, then to Claremont, and then to Comet Bay. Uh, okay. Uh, while we were at North Beach, we had two weddings, and I'll show you them. That's our second daughter. She got married first, very good, bad form. But there she is, and um, she's now, and her husband are both pastors at the Claremont, <laughs> Fremantle New Life Community Church, okay, with two lovely sons, and one of them is in the ministry with her. Okay, then our second daughter, our first daughter, Meryl, and, um, and uh, then Martin. Martin married a Chinese girl from Indonesia, doesn't speak a word of Chinese, uh, but speaks Indonesian and Japanese. Okay, you know, go on. Um, I don't know why I'm going to all those details. Um, then retirement years. Retired in 1998, um, so I had 20 years as a missionary, 20 years as a pastor, and I've had 21 retired, so I'm, I'm on overtime. Um, that was at our grandson Nathan wedding, and uh, that's the whole family there. Ah, oh, not quite. Their young son wasn't there, so I put him in. Um, <laughs> that's Martin and Cynthia on the, uh, with the Chinese, and so, okay. So he's uh, part Chinese, part Aussie. Uh, Denzel, his name, and all the rest of the family uh, following the Lord in good jobs, everything's wonderful. I'm serious about that. I can't believe it. What did we do right? Everything's worked out so well, and I just thank God for it. Okay, we'll keep going. So, retirement, we had a nice home on the foreshore in Singleton, and we had a caravan, and we had a good time touring around. But then I'd hardly uh, retired. In fact, at the same month that I retired, I bumped into Robin Tan, who was the pastor here, and um, we um, met him in the bookshop, and I talked to him in hockey, and I know he was, uh, oh, I didn't speak hockey. Um, you must come to my church. So the very next week I was here. That was in 1998. And I've been coming ever since. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. All right, guys. Sorry, uh, there we were at 12 Foreshore Drive, and that's where we live now. Um, in, in Singleton still, but with a very nice home. Uh, there are reasons for that. But there you are. We started here in 1998, my first sermon and you had built that church, or soon after. I preached, and you may not be interested to know now, but I, I want to know what I preached on. So I sorted out. There were eight Christmas messages and uh, a series on the heroes of faith from Hebrews 11, and then went into all the prophets, and especially into Haggai. And uh, coming soon, well, maybe in God's goodness, I may be back here to talk to you about Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. Otherwise, you'll think I'm only Old Testament. All right. Um, this is what I came about, really. That's just setting the background. My cancer journey. This is where it gets a bit tough. Um, uh, December 2000, I was diagnosed with squamous cell cancer of the mouth. Um, no big deal. I had it out with a few teeth and um, recovered. It wasn't pleasant, no doubt about that, but I was okay. But uh, seven years later, it came back, and I went to Fremantle Hospital, had that out and recovered, lost a few more teeth. Um, the, but then in April the 26th, 2018, I went to Fiona Stanley Hospital because it had come back in a big way. And so, uh, surgery for 13 hours, 
They took the roof of my mouth out, took some skin off my leg, stuck it up there, and it grew, <laughs> and that's where I am today. Um, uh, interesting, after that I had depression and hallucinations. Well, I gather it's, you know, run of the mill, but it wasn't funny. And I didn't really know what was happening to me. So I was thankful for your prayers, seriously. Uh, knowing that you were praying for me as well as other people, I thought, well, I'll get through this. But then the tracheostomy that I had was part of it, slow to heal. But before I had the uh, surgery, the doctor said to me, you have to have a tracheostomy, you know, cut across here. You may lose your voice, may come back with a different voice. I have to be honest with you, I was always thankful for my voice. I liked my voice. <laughs> it was a preacher's voice. And I didn't want to lose it. And I said to them, oh, come on. I want my voice back. And they said, well, we can't guarantee it. Tracheostomies do things to your voice. So I remember quite distinctly waking up from the surgery and the doctors came in and they said, how are you? And I said, oh, Terrible. Oh, your voice is back. <laughs> and I had my voice back. So I was very thankful for that. And I was thankful that they were thankful. They were so pleased that they had saved my voice. So I was glad that they cared enough. And uh, where are we? Where are we? Okay. Um, but the tracheostomy was slower to heal than normal. And oh, I hated that. You know, when you, um, oh, I won't go into it, come on. And, and on May the 14th, I was discharged 13 kilograms lighter, which didn't do a bit of harm. Um, I needed that, but there we are. The, uh, but the mouth cancer, uh, I had a PET scan to see how much more I had, and it showed colon cancer. Ugh. I should have been thankful, because it meant that they got it early. Um, but uh, it was removed surgically in February. Don't ever get colon cancer, it's horrible. It's embarrassing. Um, you know, when your bowels go wrong, bleh. it just isn't pleasant. And for someone who's a, you know, reserved, the preacher, like me, certain reservations, are, uh, you, you, you learn to forget. Anyway, they uh, operated, and that, by comparison with the mouth cancer, was a breeze. <laughs> no trouble at all. And then I got an ingle or hernia, and I got to have surgery, but wait for it, I can't have surgery. You know why? Because on August the 20th, I had two stents inserted after a heart attack. This is quite an organ recital, isn't it? But uh, this is just how it's been. Um, I can't have uh, surgery for my hernia because I'm on blood thinners for 12 months. But the time will come, no doubt, when all that will get straightened out. And I was, I was due to come to here on the 25th and had to cancel it because I'd had a heart attack. Um, I thought I had indigestion. And then I thought, oh no, it's just a cold. Yeah. Anyway, they told me, you've had a heart attack and that's that. Well, what have I learned from my cancer journey? And this, I guess, is what um, really I want to talk about. I've learned thankfulness for 86 great years. Well, some of you can match that or you do better. But not everyone is given the chance to grow old. So appreciate and thank God for every single day of your life. If you've got old, it's a privilege even though it's not easy. And I've learned 
to be thankful for those, for my family and friends and the family of God. Because thankfulness increases. You know that growing old is not easy. I've learned that. And it continues. But you also learn acceptance. Acceptance. And in my case, um, with the mouth cancer, I'm numb all up there. So if I sound funny talking to you, just think it's cute, okay? <laughs> it's because I'm numb and I haven't quite learned how to say everything and not everything comes out right. But I do my best. Okay. Son though he was, Jesus learned obedience from what he suffered. I can't explain all that, but I know it's true. And I've learned to trust in a loving Saviour God. It's become more and more important to me to see God as someone who loves me absolutely. Absolutely nothing separates us from the love of God. And you hang on to that. And that no trial will come that you cannot bear. Paul is a great example. I think he, he lists seven problems he had. And persecution right through, and he doesn't even mention his health. But he would have had health problems. But he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Not that you don't have all these things. But in them, you grow and learn, and you learn trust. Now, I know that trust means taking a leap of faith. And I've taken that leap of faith. I've never been sorry. I was talking to a, oh, by the way, I still play tennis, and I still win, sometimes. In fact, mostly. And most of them are between 60 and 80, and I'm 86, so, okay, I'm doing pretty well. But I was saying, uh, one of my tennis players is a quite devout Hindu. And he was saying to me, what is the greatest value in your life? And I said to him, the best thing that's ever happened to me is that I became a Christian the best thing, because it's given me boundaries, it's given me assurance, it's given me security, it's given me love and peace. And he nodded. He's a religious man. He said, yes, I'm the same. Religion does that. So we had a, quite an interesting discussion, but you see, what you believe in is, and what you live for, that is your religion. And we live for money, or pleasure, or progress. That's our God. You live for God and Christ. It means a lot more. That's your God. But I made that step of faith as a 16-year-old, and I've never regretted it. And in my mind, I have a picture that God in Jesus loves me. It's immeasurable. It's infinite. It will never change. Isn't that worthwhile? Isn't that wonderful? It really is. Okay. Thankfulness, acceptance, trust. That's pretty basic, you know. 
but nothing too obscure or difficult to understand in any of those. That's basics. But they are what makes life worthwhile. They are the essence of life. Thankfulness, acceptance, trust. Nothing better. Okay. I come to you limping like Jacob. As I said, I wonder sometimes how my words come out. I'm not going to worry about it. I've given up worrying about it. But Jacob, you know, was going to meet with um, going to meet with Esau. And he sent messages ahead to ask for peace. And he wasn't at peace. He was dead scared. But Esau would attack him and get even for the way Jacob had deceived him. Esau wasn't a nice man either. But Jacob had taken advantage. And he knew he had. Jacob was a God lover and a good man, but he knew he'd done wrong and he was scared of Esau. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives and so on and crossed the ford of the Jacob. And that night, when he was left alone, a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. That was a turning point in Jacob's life. He wrestled with God. And his name became Israel. But he had a bad hip. He limped. He went through life limping. He was physically weakened. Why? We don't really know. We're not told. But I imagine that it was a reminder of his character flaws. What he was before that dream. The way he had treated Esau. And he knew that he was a schemer and a deceiver and a supplanter and a man who was out to get what he could get. And there were character flaws. And that hip, that limping, reminded him that's how you once were. Now you're Israel. Don't be the same. And Paul said something similar. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Probably a sickness. Okay? Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. It reminded Paul, for well, Paul was continually reminded, whenever he got sick, or had this thorn, or whatever it was, that he needed God. And that with all his skills and all his training 
and even his spirituality, which was great. He needed God to do the work. Lest I become conceited. Easy to become conceited. But no, that messenger, that thorn in the flesh kept him. Well, as I said, I'm, I feel like Jacob. I know I'm 86 and I'm, I should perhaps be accepting, but I still have a pulpit ministry, but I'm aware that it's not what it was. I'm not as strong, my mind isn't as clear, my voice is as good, I think, but my addiction isn't because of the numbness here. But like, so like Paul of old, I'm saying, Lord, you minister through me in spite of my limping, my weakness. And so it's happening. In psalm, there's a wonderful psalm, Psalm 8. I'll read to you just a little bit of it. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. This is our theme for the rest of the month. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of him and human beings that you care for them? But what I want you to notice how is a stronghold against the enemies established? Through the praise of children and infants. Through praise, the immaterial, the spiritual. Through the things you can't see. Praise, thoughts. They're powerful and of infants, the immature. This is where God is glorified, in the immaterial and the immature. You know, I think we are all immature, no doubt about that, in some ways. And yet God chooses to make our immaturity and our prayers something that's strong and a blessing and wonderful. Let's pray. Lord, we are reminded that our ways so easily are human, self-seeking, obscure, difficult, and your ways are different. Help us, Lord, to live as those who recognize our immaturity and recognize that what values is what our heart says, what we think, the way we react, the way we trust, the way we give thanks. Help us, we pray, that we should be amongst your people who establish a stronghold for you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thank you. Thank you. Lionel, are you going to take over? Thank you, Reverend John. And um, could I ask those who are serving in the offering? Uh, thank you, Reverend John, for coming. Thank you always for bringing the Word of God. You know, it's looking at the backstory. It it just not not being offensive, but it really it sounded like a fairy tale. Like like all odds are against you, but yet somehow. You prevail. <laughs> you know, the name John, it means God is gracious. God has been really gracious to you that you have battled with cancer, depression. I, I did not know that, but thank God that he answers prayers. Our um, closing hymn is in our red hymnal, hymn 347, entitled, Be Still My Soul. Oh, let us take up our last hymn. Let us stand. I think Reverend John, um, he's a walking testament of God being gracious not just to him, but also to us. Who knows, we, some of us may not even live to 86. But yet again, God really is real. That he can preserve a servant who has so many sicknesses, and yet we can see God's glory if we know what we're looking for. I'll pass the time to Reverend John to present the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.